give you all of me, withholding nothing. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. Romans 12 tells us to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That's surrendering all to him, withholding nothing. Amen? Amen. Let's look to God. God, we come right now. Surrendering all to you. God, we confess that we've been holding back some portions of our lives. We've been holding back some things that, God, we don't want to give up. We've been holding back some things that we don't want to give to you. So, God, we come right now asking that you help us, Lord, to surrender all to you, withholding nothing. God, we thank you for this opportunity, God, to get it right. We thank you for King Jesus, uh, our Savior, uh, the one who redeemed our soul. We thank you. So God, we ask right now that you would open up our ears that we might hear. Open up our hearts, God, that your word might penetrate our very souls. God, that to the end that we might be different. That a soul might be saved. A heart might be changed. God, we give up all ourselves to you. Have your way this morning as I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give God a hand of praise. He is a faithful, faithful God. A faithful God. Amen. I don't know about you, I get excited on Sunday mornings. I'm just uh, uh, addicted to the things of God. Uh, you know, I, I think about how I used to be in the world. You know, I mean, I was excited about doing the stuff. I don't know about you, I was pumped up about going to the club. I was pumped up about running the streets. But I didn't recognize the, the price that came along with all that. So how dare I, when I come to Christ, not give him everything that I gave the world? Amen? We, we still, even those of us who love God, will give the world more of our hearts and more of our effort than we give the things of God. We'll go to work, dog, dog tired, dead, you know. I mean, crawling up in there because we're going to get a check. But when it comes to the things of God, if we stub our toe, I just can't do it. I'm sorry. He said he wants living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. He says that's your spiritual service of worship. That's your minimum requirements. That, that don't even get you an honorable mention. That don't even get you an all-star team. That's your minimum your reasonable service of worship in consideration for what God has done. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I have nothing to do with the sermon today, but I just uh, thought I'd share that with y'all <laughs> this morning. Amen. Turn your Bibles to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. We're on a new adventure. 2 Peter. 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Chapter 1. And I want you to focus your attention on verse 3, starting at verse 3, I'm going to read verse 3 through 8, second <coughs> three. And if you're having trouble finding it, it's right after the first Peter. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, page number 1857 in my Bible. <laughs> Amen. And the Word of God says this, For His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. By these he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. Verse 5. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, 
Goodness with knowledge. Knowledge with self-control. Self-control with endurance. Endurance with godliness. Godliness with brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love. Yes. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We are starting a new series, Countermeasures. And so as we start this new series, there's some things I want to, to share with us. Listen, I, I, I've always been intrigued by strategy. You know, some people are real strategic about their lives. They got a 90-day plan, a one-year plan, a five-year plan, a 10-year plan. They, they are very strategic. I am in no way strategic by nature. But I understand that strategy has its place. Last week, we finished up uh, 1 Peter, our study there in the series Hope and Glory, by looking at the fact we don't play with the enemy. Right. Amen. The, the, the scriptures shared uh, last week talked about that the fact that the devil is a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he can devour. He is, he is one who goes to and fro. And we have a mandate to be sober and alert, right? See, the enemy is nothing to be toyed with, nothing for us to, to play around with. And one thing we learned also last week is that the enemy is strategic. I mean, he has, he has a plan. He, he has a strategy on how to handle you because all of us not the same. And some of us, you know, we, we are we running strong. So, so he has to, to, to come up with a different plan for you. Some of us are limping. And he's just taking his time, just like, oh, you easy prey. Amen? We have to understand he's strategic. So if he's strategic, God has a strategy for us. We learned that we must recognize the enemy. It must be ready to respond. The devil is not playing. And when it comes to spiritual warfare, we cannot play with the enemy. Now we are starting this series in 2 Peter. The name of the series, again, is Countermeasures. We have to understand we have this enemy that is strategic and he is prepared to attack. And we must be ready to counter his attacks. Thus, we find our time in 2 Peter that there are some countermeasures to help us understand that we are equipped for the attack and that the attack is not just from the outside. Uh, but it's also from within. Amen? Uh, it's also from within. So before uh, I address our countermeasures from this text, let's first kind of lay out some definitions for what I mean by countermeasures. I was sharing with my wife part of the message, and, and, and I said, uh, it's countermeasures. She's like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> I don't know what that means. If you are uh, in uh, uh, any kind of military service or, or you are in uh, the tech field in IT, you understand the term countermeasures. Amen? Listen, when we look at the word uh, countermeasure, the definition gives us a, a little help, amen? When we look at the word countermeasure, it is a measure or action taken to counter or offset another action. As a general concept, it implies precision and is in any technology or tactical solution or system, often for a military application, is designed to prevent an undesirable outcome in the process. Amen. We often use countermeasures all throughout life. We don't label them. Amen. If you are a boxer, you're familiar with the counterpunch. Amen. If, if, if you are in, in any part of life when you are faced with some things that you don't want the desired impact, you have to do something to counter that. And, and the best way to be uh, able to counter something is to be prepared for the attack. See, simply put, countermeasures are actions that take uh, a counteract, to, we take to counteract an attack. 
And as we know from the word of God, we are under constant attack. You may not know it. You may be comfortable in your little blue uh, chair, amen. But it is a war going on and you got a target on your back. If you name the name Jesus, if you are his child, you have a target on your back and there is a war going on. Listen, the Cold War was one of the greatest wars that uh, America ever had to deal with. Amen. And there was no missiles, no, no gunfire or anything. Amen. Because the attack is not always physical. It's not always with bullets. It's not always with missiles. Sometimes the attack is right there in your mind. Some of us are in a battle right now in your present condition, in your seat right now. War is being waged in your mind and you're doing everything you can to battle. But you need some countermeasures to handle the attack. I remember the first time I saw the Harrison Ford movie, Air Force One. It was a trip kind of watching that movie because here it is, this big old plane uh, being attacked, right? And, 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 and when the missiles came, they used countermeasures. Uh, the plane released these flares and the, the heat-seeking missiles chased the flares Instead of going after the plane, the pilot took evasive action. He was uh, ducking and dodging with this big old plane in the sky. See, in Air Force One, the, the pilot and those aboard were using countermeasures to avert an attack. Amen? Listen, our spiritual lives are under attack, and daily the enemy is firing missiles at us. He's firing missiles at your marriage trying to destroy you and your spouse. He's firing missile, missiles at your family, trying to break up the unity that's there. He's firing missiles at your children, trying to distract you from trying to raise them up in the way that they should go. He's firing missiles on your job so that you might think that your boss is the enemy when we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. He's firing missiles in your neighborhood, missiles in your community, missiles in your mind. We're under attack, and we got to take some countermeasures. Amen? Amen. Amen? He is seeking to destroy us. He is trying to damage our witness. Wow. However, God has given us countermeasures to thwart his attack. And in step 2 Peter right on time for us. See, this letter is distinctly different than 1 Peter. In light of full disclosure, let me share this with you. Uh, when we look at 2 Peter, we have to understand in church history, this is one of the most disputed books. Amen. And one reason it's one of the most disputed books is that you had critics that doubted it was Peter that wrote it. And one of the reasons they doubted that it was Peter that wrote it, the style and content was so different than 1 Peter. Amen. But let me tell you this, rest assured. That the critics have been put to sleep. Amen. Because we find out that this word is that of the apostle Peter. And these instructions goes right to the heart of God toward what we need. Amen. First Peter, uh, second Peter tells us that in chapter one, uh, verse one and two, he says this, Simeon Peter or Simon Peter, as some of your, your Bibles may say, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have obtained a faith of equal privilege with our with ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. He says in verse 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. Here Peter identifies himself. He gives his full name. He, he gives his given name, which is Simon. Then he gives his Lord given name, which Christ gave him when he told him, Thou art Petros, you are the rock. And on you, on the fact that you have declared that I am the Messiah, that I shall build my church. He gives his full name, Simon Peter, a slave to Christ. Amen. Letting his recipients also know that we have the same faith. That we have the same God. We serve the same Savior. And he just gives a very common greeting, giving them grace and peace, the blessing. See, in his first epistle, Peter emphasized the grace of God. 
But in this second letter, his emphasis is on the knowledge of God. We see in this uh, second Peter, the word know or knowledge is used at least 13 times in these three short chapters. See, we learned in first Peter about the hope and glory that we find in Christ. And now we see that God is going to use Peter to instruct us to deal with some countermeasures we need to, to live the godly life and also to deal with the fakes, the phonies that stand in this church. Right, right. Yeah, just stick around for the latter weeks as we uh, kind of mind our way through this. As we look here, the word know or knowledge does not mean a mere intellectual assent. Uh, it means an understanding of truth. Though it is included, it means a living participation in truth. You know, some of us act like the truth of God is out there. Uh, but this is living truth that we must interact with and live with. We have the spirit of truth dwelling in us, those of us that are believers. And so we must interact with these truths. When it talks about for us to know or getting to know Christ, it's about an intimate knowledge of him. Amen. And John 17, 3 says this, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you sent. See, this know or this knowledge denotes intimacy. So when we look at Peter, Peter opens up his letter with a description of, of the Christian life. So before he describes the counterfeits, the fakes, and the phonies in the church, he describes the true believers. And the best way to detect the fakes and phonies is to be upheld to the real thing. Amen? So, so it, a way to detect those falses is to make sure that you got the real thing. I, I love uh, Coca-Cola. Now zero. But back in the day, it was the regular stuff. Amen? <laughs> You know, and, and what do they call coke? Somebody remember the what? The real thing. The real thing. And, and when we are talking about our walk in Christ, God is looking for the real thing. The lost are looking for the real thing. And in church, we should be full of the real thing. We are to operate in truth. Amen? And then if you operate in truth, you will surely have a spiritual high and you will be able to come back the enemy's tactics. Amen? Amen? See, the best way for us to do that is by living the life God has called us to live. One of the best countermeasures of uh, the enemy's attack is a godly life. Right, right. Amen? Is a godly life. So if there's one thing I want you to, to learn from uh, our time this morning, if there's one thing I want you to pick up and run with, is this. God has equipped us to live godly lives. We have his power and we have his promises. God has equipped us. He's given us what we need to live godly lives. We have his power and his promises. Listen, when we look at this, this opening body in 2 uh, Peter, we see God challenging us through Peter to have effective and productive lives. It's God's power that enables us to make every effort to grow in our relationship with him. So let's dig into this word. Uh, chap uh, chapter 1 verse 3 says this. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. He has equipped us. With his power, by his divine power, he has given us what we need to live this life. Some of us say, well, I don't, you know, I, I gave my life to Christ, but I don't know how to live this life. I, I don't have the necessary skill set. I don't have this. I don't have that. The scripture tells us you have everything in you to live the life that God has called you to live. The same one who calls us, that is the same one who is invites us by his grace to be a part of his kingdom, to be a part of his kingdom work. He also equips us to change or to grow spiritually. Right. Listen, before Christ, 
the things of God, you are unable to put them into practice. Um, one thing I always tell, tell people is, listen, we have a tendency as believers, when we're witnessing the folk, we witness to their symptoms. We have a tendency to witness to their symptoms. We have somebody, oh, they're shacking up, and all we're talking about is them shacking up, or, or somebody who is in, 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 uh, who's a liar, amen, and we're talking about their lying. You know, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not do this, and thou shalt not do that. Listen, without Christ, they don't have the power to do nothing different. Amen. We we minister to the symptoms. Let me tell you this. Ministering to the symptoms, that's for the church. Amen. That's our job. See, because when you come to Christ, uh, the disease has been cured. Amen. The disease is, is that which is sin denotes that death that comes from being outside of Christ. When you give your life to Christ, you say. So the disease is being cured. Amen. But still, but still symptomatic. Amen. You, you, you was a liar and you might not lie like you used to. But you still got some, some residual effects, amen? It, it's thus that in the church, it's our obligation to minister to you, amen? But those outside of Christ, the disease needs to be handled first, amen? Because that's the thing that's going to kill them. It, 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 it's, it's not the symptoms that's going to kill them. It's the disease, amen? And, and, and they are only doing the thing that comes out of the fact that they are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. All of us were in that same condition, but when we came to Christ, see his blood that was shed on the cross cured us. But we still got some symptoms. So, so we must put into practice this godly life. He, he gives us the power to live out this life. A godly life includes two primary ideas. First, it describes an attitude of reverence in the presence of the one majestic and divine God. Amen. And when you say it, you should recognize the fact that God is the one who saved you. You should recognize the, the very breath that you continue to draw is by his grace. You should recognize that, that, that through his mercy, we're not getting what we truly deserve. Amen. It is an attitude of reverence to God. We treat God so casually. We, we treat him so casually. Amen. Like, like he's just, you know, Jesus is my homeboy. No, he ain't. Jesus is not your homeboy. Jesus is God. Amen. I, I understand what you mean. You want that intimate relationship. He is my friend. But don't treat him casually. He is king of kings, lord of lords. Amen. We give more reverence to POTUS than we do to Christ. Amen. Let, let, let the president, let Obama stroll up in here. Let President Obama stroll up with me. Oh, wow. It's Obama's here. Oh, everybody stand. Hey, but when we get ready to, to reverence God, I don't feel like doing all that. Right. Mm, that's all right. God know my heart. I can do that from right here. <laughs> just saying, just saying, amen. It, it is an attitude, amen. Secondly, a godly life describes actions of obedience. See, you can't circumvent that. You can't get around it, amen. You have to walk in obedience. It's interesting that we got a problem with obedience. And, and, and we practice obedience every day. If you got a job, uh, you got job requirements, amen? But your, your obedience is tied to that check. Amen? They tell you, listen, uh, uh, we told you to paint that wall. That's what we do. We painters. We paint that wall. Let me tell you to go out there and tend the garden. You, you, I don't pay you to tend the garden. I pay you to paint the wall. Amen. But but yet when it comes to the things of God, God is like, I need you to do A, B, and C. And we all doing our own thing. And then we wonder why our lives are impotent. We wonder why our prayer life is impotent. We wonder why we're not effective when we're trying to share the word of God. We wonder why. Oh, God, why all this stuff happened to me? Because you're not obedient. Jesus says, your love is measured in obedience. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will obey. Trust and obey because there's no other what? Way. Way. Huh. 
trust and obey. It's tied to obedience. At the heart of godly living and spiritual transformation is an attitude of reverence for God and actions of obedience. And we find out here in these verses that we're looking at that the source and strength to do it is his divine power. Let me, let me help you out. Let me free you real quick. Let me get free right now. Just listen. You ain't strong enough to do it. You don't have the power to do it. It's only by the power of of Jesus Christ. Amen. The men we were get, we got together yesterday, and men don't don't trip ain't this close to nothing. And uh <laughs> and James McDonald shared the fact that when, when we are trying to, to, to live this godly life, we act like God's strength is something that we gotta go in and get. And we act like we it's something that we can muster up. No, what we do is we tap into Christ's strength. You, you don't have the strength. It is Christ's strength. He is made, we are made strong through him. When Paul talked about the fact that him, he being weak, amen, but when he's weak, he's made strong because he's operating in Christ's strength. Sister, you can't do it. You need Christ's strength. Brother, you can't do it. You need Christ's strength. The Bible tells us I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is Christ working in us and through us. And that takes a life of reverence, obedience, right. and surrender. Right. Mm. We have his divine power. The, these words describe the work of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit provides the believer with gifts and the abilities to use those gifts. God's design is that through the power of the Holy Spirit, the believer is assisted in godly life. We all have spiritual gifts, all of us. When you come to Christ, you say yes to Jesus. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. Amen. He, he, he enlarges your spiritual resume. Some of us, we don't know what's on our resume because we ain't asked. Right. We don't know what's in our resume because we ain't when going to the work. God has endowed you with gifts to be able to be used in the building up of his kingdom. Not to give you no name, not to get your name in the light. But none other but to bring those to him. Amen. We are endowed with his divine power so that we might live godly. Right. Listen, this process is assisted through our knowledge of him who called us. See, you can you start to get the power when you know that you got the power. Right. Right. Uh, when, you, when you know that you have a relationship with Christ. And that his power is unlimited. All he's telling you to do is to tap in. Amen. Right, right. See it's through him that knowledge of him who called us. I understand that I can overcome my problems. Because I remember what the scripture says. Jesus says listen. I was under attack. The world came against me. But be encouraged because I have overcome the world. So the one who called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Has overcome the world. Has given me the power to overcome the world. I can rest assured and trust him that he will help me. Amen. But I got to know him. I got to spend time with him. Amen. In my line of work you have to have some trust. Amen. You got to trust that somebody has been doing their homework, that someone has been doing what they're supposed to do. Sometimes we enter homes and different things, guns, draw, all kind of crazy stuff. You better rest assured that that dude behind you better know what he's doing. Amen. Let, let me tell you, there's some folk in the church I wouldn't trust to have my back. Because they act like they don't know the one who called them. Right. Amen. But the ones I trust, I know they pray. The ones I trust, I know they in God's word. The ones I trust, they've been tried and true. Amen. They've shown that they can trust God in the, in, in the, in the bad times. They've shown that they can trust God in the, in the rough times. Amen. And when we go to fight, I know I ain't got to keep looking back. Is he still there? You know, some of us have those fair weather friends. And when you're going through, you just got to keep looking back. Look, if I got to keep looking back, I'm in trouble because I'm I got an enemy in front of me. Right. Right. See, see, I know I can trust you huh, when you are in God's word. So again, this refers to us, our personal knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
into a growing relationship with him. The more we come to know Jesus Christ in a personal way, the more we begin to understand who he really is and what he's really done for us. When you start to know Christ, you understand the magnitude of what he brought you out of. Uh, isn't it funny how we paint the past in different light? You know, we some, some of us, you know, some of us, I told Deidre I wasn't using a sports analogy, but some of us, uh, the more and more we, the farther and farther the look, we look back, the better and better we was. Hey, you know, you, you was riding the pine, but 20 years later, as you tell the story, you was a starting point gun. Hey, you know, we, we sit tend to, to forget, amen? You know, I'm telling the truth. But listen, when we start to know Christ and we start to look back over our lives, we recognize the magnitude of what he's done for us. We recognize the magnitude of where he brought us out of. We understand the magnitude of the salvation we have. We understand the magnitude of his mercy and his grace toward us. Amen. Some of us are still perpetrating like we point guards and we know we was on the pine. Some of us, we forget how sinful and towed back our lives were. We forget how rebellious we were. We forget how much y'all mama was talking about you the handful while we talking about our kids were the, were the handful. We forget and God wants to remind us as you grow in Christ, you understand the magnitude of his forgiveness. The magnitude of his love. Not only are we equipped with God's power, we are endowed with God's promises. Right. I love promises. Yeah. Amen. Listen at verse 4. says this, By these he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. Listen, his very great and precious promises refers to the promises Jesus gave during his earthly Life. Listen, Peter was the impetuous one. Impetuous Peter. And, and Jesus kept telling his disciples, you know, I, I got to go. I, I got to bounce. I got, God had a plan when I came and, and, and I got to go. And Peter was like, no, bro, you can't go nowhere. You, you need to stay here with us. And, and we, you know, we, we getting ready to take over the world. And, and Jesus was like, listen, if I don't go, then I'm not, I can't send the comfort. If I don't go, the Holy Spirit cannot come. Amen. Then he, he told him in Acts, he said, listen, tarry for a little while. Uh, tarry for a little while because I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. you, you got to understand the significance of that. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come and would rest on individuals for specific assignments. And then he would leave. Amen. But those of us that are in Christ, amen. amen, he doesn't just come and leave. He takes up residence. And the reason he takes up residence in our lives is because he gives us the power to walk out the things that God called us to. But not only that, he is the inheritance. He is the guarantee of the fact that we have a heavenly place with Christ. So listen, when the Holy Spirit dwells in you, he's there for the long haul. Amen. He's never going to abandon you. He, you have God. The living God resting and residing in you. Amen. And he's given us precious promises. God is never going back on his word. Like Numbers 23 tells us, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, he will do it. If he's spoken it, it shall come to pass. God is a promise keeper. See, many of us, we, we've broken promises, and we've had promises broken to us. Listen, if God gives you a promise, he'll never go back. I, listen, I know that sometimes in our lives we have things that's rocking and rolling. Our lives are in turmoil. Our marriage is in turmoil. Our children are going crazy. The job is nuts. But God has not forgotten you. God has promised that he will be with you every step of the way. These promises are precious, amen? These promises tell us that the Holy Spirit will be with us. In John's Gospel, Jesus promises the continual presence of the Holy Spirit to assist us in our obedience. 
Amen. In fact, the common designation of the Holy Spirit in the, the New Testament is that of the Consular. It affirms uh, that understanding since the term Consular means in Greek the paraclete, which means the one that comes alongside to help. You know, some of us, I had a little trouble in, in some parts of college. Amen. I, 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 I had a little trouble. And most of us, when we didn't have a little trouble in school, we get a tutor. Amen. But can you imagine going to take your test, and when you get to a tough part, looking over to your tutor sitting next to you, saying, what's the answer to this? And the tutor saying, don't worry, I'm going to give it to you. Because I know you study. See, the scripture tells us that, that, that God will bring to remembrance all those things, right? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we go through, we got this helper with us, this tutor that tells you, I'll give you what to say. I'll give you what to do. All you got to do is trust me. The paraclete is that one that comes alongside us. He's with us every step of the way. And a lot of times the problem comes, we don't want to listen to our help. God is saying, listen, I'm telling you, hang a left up here. Hang a left because straight ahead is trouble. You're like, well, I've been straight ahead before. God, I, I got this. Amen. You got me going on a detour. I'm not familiar with what's to the left, Lord, so I'm not going that way. I'm going to go with what's familiar with me. Amen. And, and, and the Lord in his mercy and his grace, he'll let you go. Yeah. Amen. And let you take your lumps along the way. But you can't blame him. And God, why you let me go through that? He said, I told you to go left. Amen. I told you to go left. See, the paraclete is there. The, the Holy Spirit guides us and directs us. And not only guides and directs us, but equips us so that we can do what God has called us to do. He equips us and reminds us of those precious promises we have in God. When we look at the Old Testament, it's full of promises. We look at the New Testament, it's full of promises. God promised never to leave you nor forsake you. You may feel forsaken, but it's not because of God. God told you that he will provide for all your needs according to his riches and glory. And we eating a piece of bread, we're like, God, when are you going to feed me? He's like, I'm feeding you now. Amen. Some of us are just like Israel. God poured down manna from heaven, gave them a holy provision, and they cried and complained. Where the sugar at? Where the frosting? Amen. Where the, where, where's the seasoning to this? When God, God, that's all we going to get? His promises. Precious, precious promises. Listen, in some places uh, in the word in this word, uh, this word paraclete was an ancient warrior's term. Greek soldiers always went into battle in pairs. So that when the enemy attacked, they could draw together back to back, covering each other's blind side. The soldiers would battle, uh, and their partner was called the paraclete or the helper. So, too, God does not send us into battle alone. Amen. He's back to back. Stand up, JB, real quick. Amen. He's back to back. So, when, when I'm fighting my battle, I got my paraclete with me. So, he's got my back. The enemy, he don't fight fair. So, he going to try to get me from behind. Amen. He going to try to get but I don't have to worry. Because I'm back to back. I know he's back there. I don't have to worry because I know God got my back. I don't have to worry because I know God got me covered. I know my back, my backside is usually vulnerable. But because God is there, I can trust him. And you know what? He promised me he'll be there. He promised me he'll stay there. He promised me never to leave me in back. He promised me that he's there with me every step of the way. He's got my back. He's got my back. So these promises, through these promises, the characteristics of Jesus Christ mentioned at the end of verse 3 as his own glory and goodness. See, these words describe who Christ is. They describe the majestic nature of Christ. The point of the verse is that the promises of Christ are related to the work and the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And they can be counted on. Mm. And not only can it be counted on, Christ is a one who makes a promise and he keeps them. 
And because he keeps them, we can count on the Holy Spirit. He is stable and he is constant. Listen, because of this ministry of the Holy Spirit, the scripture tells us we may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So when we are walking with God, when we have the when the Holy Spirit has our back, amen, we can escape the corruption of the world. So when the enemy is throwing attacks, we live in godly. I, I can handle that. Amen. When the enemy is trying to come against us, we can stand because the Holy Spirit has our back. When the culture is trying to get us to mold us and shape us in, in its image, we have to remember that we're molded and shaped in the image of Christ. Amen. Amen. The culture, the world wants to draw us away from God. Listen, we have been pulled out of that world. God has snatched us out of that world and he's brought us into his world and we are to walk in that, to stand on his precious promises. Listen, God has equipped us to live godly lives. We have his power and he, we have his promises. We are equipped by God's power. We're endowed by God's promises. But as a result of God's divine power and based on his promises, there should be some signs right. of spiritual growth in the believer's life. Right. Show some signs. Right. You say you love me, show some signs. Amen? Amen. Verses 5 through 7 address our responsibility in our spiritual growth. See, God has given us everything we need for godly living. Now we must act on what he's given us. I know sometimes we just want, God, you just do it. Amen. You know that the, the familiar song or, or phrase, just let go and let God. See, many of us, when we let go, we think we go to the couch and chill and let God do whatever God does. But no, this is a participatory uh, the kingdom building exercise. Amen. That we all, when you let go and let God, that means you're going to follow God wherever God takes you. Amen. We are to give it into God's hand, but he's called us to action. Amen. Listen to what these verses say in verses 5 through 7 as I'll push through this. It says this, for this very reason, make every effort. I think that's an action term. Right? Make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, well, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Make every effort. Amen. That is us participating in with God in his divine nature to do the work he's called us to do. God has given us an incredible gift, his Holy Spirit, that dwells in us. His Spirit gives us the power to grow in Christ. All of us should be matriculating, as the old folks say, in our relationship with Christ. Amen. We should not be 20 years in the church still in kindergarten, amen, looking for our afternoon snack. We should be growing in Christ, amen. It says, make every effort. Transformation just does not happen. We must participate in it, amen. That is the believer's obligation. We must resolve a desire, a commitment to growth and transformation must be a part of our individual life. If we are to be part of what God is calling us to do, it is the Holy Spirit that will help us in our endeavor. But we must make every effort. And the base of what we're building and adding the supplement to is our faith. Right. Amen. Our faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We are building our Christian character. We're building our godly lives on the foundation of faith. He tells us the first thing we need to do is add goodness, right? Goodness deals with uh, uh, the moral excellence. Are we morally excellent? Amen. As believers, are we are we seeking to do what is good and what is right? And we can only do that by the power of Christ. Then that word again, knowledge. Knowledge here concentrates on the practical knowledge or knowledge that is lived out. We got a whole bunch of folk who got head knowledge. They, they can quote to you a scripture. They, they can tell you about Bible and the Bible and the importance of church and, and Bible study, but they have no practical knowledge because what's in their head, they don't put it into practice. Amen? 
Amen. They may be able to 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 to, to uh, share a memory verse and all that stuff. What good is a memory verse if it, you can't live it out? What good is oh knowing that uh, no unwholesome words shall proceed out of my mouth if every other word out your mouth is unwholesome? What good is it to say uh, oh I know be anxious for nothing but everything I'm worried about? It, 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 it has to be practical knowledge. Were you putting that thing into practice? Then he says, after that, self-control. Amen. I love uh, uh, Brother Willie Wilson, amen. And, and he used to hang out, he been hanging out with me on Tuesday for years. And when we would gather to pray after class, he would say, uh, uh, Reverend, uh, pray for that self-control thing. <laughs> 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 amen. We, we, we need that self-control. It describes the inner strength to control our own desires and cravings. The believer through the enabling power of the Holy Spirit is not to be a prisoner to our desires, our craving. We are to be a prisoner to Christ. You should have some self-control. Right. Amen. Amen. Listen, let me share this. <clears throat> um, many of us, when you're on a, on a diet, have you ever noticed that the, the cakes that are baked just smell so good? The, the cookies just seem like they got... More sugar. Yeah. Amen. They, you know, they just be calling me. It's calling me, right? Do you know when you when you desire to come to Christ and to walk out this, this faith, when you commit that you know what, God, I'm with you, amen. I'm going on a spiritual diet, then, then the world starts to magnify. You know, the enemy starts to put a little strobe light on your sin and make you think how wonderful it was then. He, he want, wants you to think it smells so sweet, but it ain't no good for you. Uh, just like that cake will blow your diet, sin will blow your walk. Amen? He, he is asking for us to have some self-control. And the self-control has perseverance. In its most literal rendering, it means to walk under the load. See, perseverance doesn't mean that you get to escape. It's closely tied to the word endurance, which in the Greek is uh, hupomone, which means remain under the stress. Amen. Those of these of you who, who get in the gym and you do weight training, amen. Listen, you won't grow unless you experience some resistance. Right. Some things you gotta stay under for a while. Right. Some of us are in trials and we asking God for the escape hatch, and he like, no. It ain't time for you to go yet. Uh, the heat, I need to turn it up a little bit because I'm trying to refine some things in you. Amen. We're like, God, just let me get off the boat. It's rocky. And he's like, no, because I, I need to let you hand, learn how to handle rocky waters. Amen. Well, well God, the, the marriage is on the rocks. The, the relationship is on the rocks. The job is going through. And God's like, no, no, no. You don't get out. You're going to learn to trust me in it. See, I mean, sometimes you, we, we just want God to give me an escape hatch. You know, I just want, I want to pull and go. And God is like, mm -mm. I need you to persevere. I need you to stay under. Because when you come through, amen, when you come through, you're going to be able to minister to somebody else who did it. Someone who wants to give up. Someone who wants to quit. Someone who thinks it can't, it can't happen. Amen. But you got to sometimes stay in that thing. Persevere, persevere. Then that uh, perseverance, godliness, and this virtue means that again, that reverence, obedience for God. And then this word, brotherly kindness. This is where we get our word Philadelphia from. It is that a common word to describe the fact that we are to, to have loving relationships within our family. It is that kinship that we share as brothers and sisters in Christ. That means that we also are to bear one another's burdens. Amen. We are to lift one another up. As brothers and sisters, I shouldn't be afraid to help carry a load. Right. Uh, we talked about this in one of our other series. Amen. That, that it says that we are to bear each other's burdens. But then again, it tells us that each person is responsible for their own load. And if you remember my illustration, uh, I shared with you the fact that my, my boys helped me move in my house. Amen. And they helped carry that burden. They, they lifted up some furniture. They took some stuff in. Amen. They, 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 they helped carry my load. And then I turned to them and said, hey, can y'all help pay my mortgage? And they say, 
you, some of us got to bear our own burden and carry our own load. <laughs> Amen. So there's some things that, have, and we love each other to help us to carry that load, but there's some things that we got to deal with on an individual basis. But here that brotherly love is, we must come alongside. Why in the church we got folk with their back broken, carrying all kind of stuff that they don't have to carry alone, and we just, ooh, you can make it. Come on, come on. I, I know, just stand up straight. They're like, it's heavy. No, no, I'm praying for you. And God is like, pick it up, help them. They're like, no, they, they got to do that on their own. Folks, carrying burdens that God has equipped you to help with. God has gifted you to help with. And some of you, God is giving you a direct instruction to help. And you're like, no, no, no. If you love your brother, if you love your sister, you come alongside. Amen? Listen, I got to close the last one. Here is we get wrapped up with that love. And here, that is that agape love, that beneficial love. It is a deliberate desire for the highest good of the person who is being loved. It's considering others more important than yourself. It is a demonstration of a sacrificial act for that person's good. See, that kind of love is the love that looks out for others before you look out for yourself. Amen. You know that you on that diet and your stomach is grumbling and you see somebody else on the street. Amen. You walking out with your Big Mac and your fries knowing good and well you can miss about 12 of them. Amen. And that person is hungry and, and, and you looking at them and God bless you, brother. And he had quoted that at work up on getting you one of them Big Macs. When God is saying, open that bag, give them the whole bag. Mm. See, agape love is beneficial love. It's sacrificial love. It gives the bag up, amen. And matter of fact, it gives the bag up and don't even worry about having to go back in and get another Big Mac. It gives the bag up knowing that you don't have the $5 to go get your Big Mac combo. I'm going to trust God to fill me. God bless you. That's that sacrificial love. Amen. Knowing that God is the one that will repay. Knowing that God is the one that's going to take care of you. Amen. Because we go back to the fact that we trust his promises. Right. right? Amen. That love. And then we get a warning in verse 8. Let me close this. We get a warning in verse 8. It says this. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of your of our Lord Jesus Christ. These terms are very specific. Useless and unfruitful. Let me tell you, it's a secret. Nobody telling people in the church. I don't know why people, do you know it's folk who are useless and unfruitful in the church? Wow. Amen. The Jesus' desire is that we bear fruit. Amen. We, that's how we know if, if you are in a relationship with Christ. We know by the fruits that they bear. Amen. And so we have to be cautious to make sure that when we grow in Christ, if these attributes are growing in our lives, we are, are, are useful and fruitful by default. Right, right. Amen. If we're loving if we're doing what God has called us to do, if we're building up these characteristics in our lives, if we're not sitting like a tree or a mm, fruit come. You ain't water, ain't had no sunlight. Come on, fruit. Some of us in our Christian life, come on, self control. Ain't studied the Bible. Uh, come on, love. Ain't pray for your enemy. Come on, self-control. Come on, goodness. No, it's not coming. You got to do some stuff. You got to be watered by the word. You got to spend time in prayer. You got to be loving to your, 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 your enemy. You got to love those who don't like you. I'm just saying. Right, just saying that. Man, I ain't got no more time. Time is up. Time is up. Listen. Listen. This is what. Check out verse 9. I got to throw this in there. I got to throw in verse 9. It says this. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted. And has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. 
Wow. For God. Amen. One interpreter said this about this verse. In their blindness, short-sightedness, and forgetfulness, they no longer understand their past sins, their present disobedience, or their future condemnation. We forgot where he brought us from. We forget that we disobey in man. And we don't understand what the consequences are when we continue in that present condition. Listen, the word shares with us that God has equipped us to live godly lives. We have his power and his promises. Those are countermeasures against the enemy's attack. We are equipped by God's power. We are endowed by God's promises. Living a godly life is a great countermeasure to the devil's attacks. God has equipped us to live the lives he has called us to. When we're living outside his will, disobedient, self-directed, selfish, out of his word, not praying, out of fellowship, we become easy prey. P-R-E-Y. Because we have it. P-A-P-R-A-Y. When we end up overwhelmed by the enemy on the battlefield of life, we can't blame God. He has given us everything we need to live godly lives. Listen, we must understand that he has given us his power and his promises. In a practical way, I want to leave you with this. We must be confident in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He has our backs. He's there with us every step of the way. I implore you, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal you, uh, reveal to you characteristics of the culture that he wants to take out of your life. There's some stuff he needs to prune. Amen? Some stuff that needs to go. Pledge to him your cooperation with him in conforming your life to Christ and not the culture. Take some concrete steps in building up your life in Christ. Purpose to learn about the power you have in Christ through the Holy Spirit. Purpose to learn about the promises Christ has made to you. Amen? You can only take these steps by getting into God's word. You can only take these steps by spending time with him, by spending time with prayer. And so we have everything we need to do what God has called us to do. We have everything at our disposal. All we have to do is tap in, live that godly life. Understand, he has given us a countermeasure. He's equipped us with his power and with his promises. Now it's time for us to live it out. Amen? Amen. Give God a hand of praise. God is a faithful, faithful, faithful God. Amen? I've been moving too fast and not stopping Forgetting to ask where I'm going I've been crying at night in the darkness Suffering alone in the silence I've been hiding the pain and the confusion Forgetting who holds all solutions Trying to rule the world my own way Now I'm humble enough to say that